Welcome to Hot Chips 33. Session 1. CPUs. All right, welcome to Hot Chips 33. My name's Ian Brott, um, and together with Cliff Young, I've had the opportunity to uh, chair the organizing committee for this year's Hot Chips. Uh, before we get started, I wanna take this time to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, without the sponsors, we wouldn't have a conference, so we really appreciate their uh, help and support. And I would also like to thank the team at Intel, our Rhodium sponsor. Uh, and they encourage you to keep an eye out for clues to something unexpected. Okay, so now down to some details. Uh, <clears throat> we really encourage everyone to use Slack. It's a great way to interact with the speakers, to ask for help. So the info for setting up for Slack was sent in your credentials. Uh, follow that info to, to log in and then uh, use the different channels there to interact with speakers, ask for help, uh, introduce yourself to people. Um, there are many different channels, uh, and they, diff they have a different naming scheme. So the key code for the naming scheme is based on the first letter. Uh, C is for conference talks, K is for keynotes, P for posters, S is for sponsors, if you want to go talk to our sponsors, uh, and T is for the um, uh, tutorials. Um, last year, we had some issues where uh, we had too many attendees all on the same VPN. So if you're having issues with uh, uh, image quality, please, you might want to check to see if you're on, uh, on VPN. Um, so really encourage everyone to sign up for Slack. Um, it's also a good way to get help if you're having some uh, logistical issues. Uh, just use that help channel on Slack. Uh, during the talks, the session chairs will moderate the talks, and they'll actually take questions from the Slack channels. So um, during a talk, log into the Slack channel for that talk. Um, if you've got a question, you know, look to see if it has been asked before. Uh, if it has, uh, and upvote that question with the thumbs up emoji. So that's how the session chair knows that uh, uh, there's interest in a particular question. Um, and at the end of the thread, uh, there will be a thread that gives you a chance to uh, appreciate and, and thank the speaker with the um, applause emoji. You can use other emojis as well, but uh, applause is kind of the default. Okay, so a little bit behind the scenes on Hot Chips. This is a, a volunteer-run conference. It's, it's composed of three different committees. Uh, there's the steering committee, which is responsible for uh, the overall uh, mission of the conference, the operating commi committee, which runs the, uh, the operations for the committee, and the program committee, which uh, selects and creates the program. Um, so everything here is volunteer-run, and, and the reason Hot Chips is such a special conference is all of these volunteers are from the the chip, chip community, we're CPU architects, uh, chip architects from industry or academia, and we work together to really put on the conference that we know uh, the community would, would appreciate and attend. So it's simple as that. That's why it's such a great conference is because it's from the volunteers, and the volunteers are such great representatives of, uh, of the chip community. So this is the list here of the operating committee. Um, I won't go into the details of, of everyone here, but um, I'd just really like to thank all of the volunteers from all the different committees. Um, there's a picture here from our uh, studio command center where we're operating the conference, and that was uh, Saturday night as, as things were getting set up. Um, so again, it's, it's really the, uh, the volunteers here that make this such a special conference. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce the uh, program Committee Chair, uh, Lisa Scher. Thank you, Ian. Along with Guri Sohi, who is a professor at the University of Wisconsin, we are the Program Committee Co-Chairs for Hot Ships 33, and we'd like to welcome all of you to our program. I hope that you're all in a safe and comfortable place to listen to a lot of excellent talks today, and I hope that you're all staying healthy. Let's go ahead and continue, Ian. As Ian said, everybody who works on this conference are volunteers, and this year's Hot Chips 33 program committee is also made up of volunteers. These are people who are very dedicated to 
working through selecting the best possible talks that all of you are going to have a lot of interest in and will enjoy. They come across industry, they come from universities, you can see all of their affiliations here and you can see that it's a very broad based group of people. I want to thank them here as I have a moment to say thank you for all of your hard work. The types of things that they do for getting this program put together is to identify keynote speakers, encourage them to be willing to give presentations here. They go out and solicit submissions for talks. They will read every single one of the submissions, and there are many, very carefully. And then we select those submissions for the talks that are going to be given and the posters that are going to be presented. And after we select the talks, the session chairs spend countless hours working with the speakers to get their talks really high quality with a lot of engineering content so that they're not just marketing talks or the kinds of deep details that all of you are actually interested in seeing about the types of chips that are being presented today. We have, this is a bit of retrospective. We did tutorials yesterday, but since this entire conference is being recorded, I thought I'd mention it in case you didn't have a chance to view them. You can go back and view the tutorials um, now. In the first session, we had ML performance and challenges of machine learning, and we had excellent speakers from NVIDIA, Google, Intel, GraphCore, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. And as you can see, that's an incredible list of people who are working on machine learning all the time. And so they are very knowledgeable. They gave excellent tutorial presentations covering the breadth of uh, machine learning, including how challenging it is to produce different types of networks, how to tune them for performance, how you run benchmarks, what are all the details behind MLPerf, and um, the challenges of managing the very large networks these days and the size of the data. So this was a very interesting tutorial for people who might not know the background and details about what goes on in machine learning. Following machine learning um, tutorial, we had the advanced packaging tutorial. This one was dear to my heart. Um, but we had speakers from Intel and AMD talking about both the packaging technology and how they actually use it in some of their very high-end products. We had speakers from TSMC talking about their technology for advanced packaging. And then we had a follow-up at the end with um, an expert in the field from TechSearch International, Inc. And Jan put it all together to kind of give people an understanding of the various different packages they had just been um, listening to how you might choose what, what would work well for your product. So this is also a great tutorial. It's all, video's all there, so if you want to go back and follow it up sometime later, you can. We have three keynotes for this year's conference. A little later today, we're going to have Art DeJuice, who's the CEO of Synopsys, and he's going to talk about um, artificial intelligence and how it interacts with the tools for designing chips. His title is, Does Artificial Intelligence Require Artificial Architects? And that will be at 12.30 today, that specific time. Later in the afternoon today, here in Pacific Time, um, we're going to have Ab Abraham Bachrock, who is the CTO at Skydio. And he's going to be talking about the Skydio autonomy engine. I am hoping for demos in this particular keynote because it's a pretty cool autonomous flight vehicle that they, that they developed. Then tomorrow, uh, in the morning Pacific time, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, we're going to have Dmitry Kuznetsov, who is the Deputy Undersecretary for AI and Technology in the Department of Energy. And for those of you who do high-end compute, you know that there is a lot of interest from the Department of Energy in very high-end performance chips and artificial intelligence. And he's going to talk a little bit about what the architectural challenges are in that space. And that will be tomorrow, as I said, at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Letting you know that we had um, 85 abstract submissions and we had 27 accepted talks. Yeah, not, thank you. Keep going. I don't know why I have a graphic here. OK, later today we're going to have CPUs. And then we're going to be seeing a couple of interesting chips that came out of academia from the University of Wisconsin and the University of Michigan. We have infrastructure and data processors. And rounding out the program this afternoon into the evening will be chips that are basically enabling chips for automotive, 5G, and high bandwidth memory products. So a little bit of a spectrum of, of papers today. Tomorrow, we're going to be swinging back to focus a little bit more on machine learning. We're going to both looking at 
machine learning as inference in the cloud, and then look at machine learning, the larger, um, heavier duty lifting chips for doing training and computation platforms. We're also going to, because I know there's a lot of people who have interest in this, talk about graphics and video processors. And we're rounding out tomorrow's session with some very new technologies. We have a couple of sensors, we have quantum computing, and we have AR contact lenses. I'm looking forward to that talk as well. Okay, Ian talked about this already, but we basically have a Q&A process through Slack. So there's channels, P please post your questions in the appropriate channel. There's a couple of graphics there, keep going. There we go, and on. And last but not least, we selected 18 outstanding posters. These were, these were posters that probably some of them could have been excellent talks and we just didn't have space in the schedule. So I encourage you to go check them out. The posters will be staffed, determined by the presenter themselves because these posters are from across the world. We have posters from Europe, we have posters from the Far East and Asia, we have posters from the Americas. You can see them at the bottom of the program tab. If you go to the conference website and scroll down below the program, you will see the poster links down there. There are Slack channels there where you can interact with the presenters, and there are links to all the poster PDFs. So please, during breaks or even you know, later this evening, because some of these presenters are in completely different time zones, they may be available to chat with you, please avail yourself of this resource. And last but not least, I just want to encourage you to sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy our conference. Thank you for joining us. Now, we're going to be heading in to our first session, which is CPUs, which was pretty much the focus of the original hot chips. All the different microprocessors that were being developed at the time was one of the reasons we got together and started this conference. And we're pretty excited about the, the CPUs we've got today. They're gonna to be very, very interesting. We've got a good broad spectrum. This morning's chair for that session is Namsung King. And Namsung is an IEEE fellow. He's an ACM fellow. He has been a C corporate senior vice president at Samsung and he's currently a professor at the University of Illinois. So he is an excellent person to have shepherded these papers into the talks that you were going to get to see today. And from that, I'm going to let this travel on into the first session. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Nam Sung Kim, and the session chair. And I'm very excited to be the session chair for the first session of Hot Chip 20, uh, 2021. Uh, this session will give you four presentations on the state of the art CPUs, two from Intel, Elder Lake, and the Sapphire Rapid CPUs, one from AMD. Gen 3 CPUs, and the one from IBM, Teldon processor. The first presentation is from Intel, and the speaker will present the recently announced Elder Lake uh, architecture comprising heterogeneous cores and uh, other interesting features for wide range of uh, power and uh, energy efficient client processors. And let me introduce our speaker, Dr. F. Rosen. Effie is an Intel Fellow and the lead power and the performance architect of Intel's mobile client processors. Effie joined Intel in 1995, and since 2000, he has been leading notebook system and the process of, uh, processors power performance architecture. Effie is holding over 150 patents, and uh, he is a three times winner of the Intel Achievement Award. Now, Effie will start his presentation. Hello everyone. I'm pleased to introduce today Alder Lake. Alder Lake brings an innovative hybrid architecture. This is the biggest architecture change we have driven in recent years. Today, I will share with you the why and the how. We all understand the importance of data and compute to our, to our modern society, and we are driving for more and more compute. Today, most applications are single or lightly threaded applications. The importance of multi-threading is rising with data decomposition and machine learning algorithms. Furthermore, the recent reality reminds us how we, real users, are using our computers. It is never single application. It is always some 
productivity workload running while we collaborate with our colleagues with the browser open in the background. We have antivirus, data security, and so on. For many years, we have been driving the single threat performance by adding new and smarter architectural structures, new instructions, and accelerators. These were driving size and power. The way that we address the multi-threading vector was taking this growing core and duplicating it many times to create the multi-core processor. Basically, moving in lockstep on the diagonal of this chart. This served us well for many years, but recent reality of Moore's law and the NART scaling drives now for a change. The innovative approach that we have taken on Alder Lake was to break this diagonal and introduce two new cores, the performance core and the efficient core. To address the single thread performance, we unleashed the P core and allow it to grow and deliver even more performance. To address the multi-threading, we created an efficient core intended to, to deliver the highest computational density possible within the constraints. Those two cores are architecturally equivalent with different microarchitecture and different design point. We call this innovative architecture performance hybrid. Now let us have a look at those two cores. First, the performance core. The performance core is built to push the limits of low latency, high single thread performance by building a wider machine, deeper and smarter. It is built to excel on large footprint code and data, and the design point is high speed. The efficient core is designed to construct a throughput machine and deliver the most efficient computational density. You can see here that this is not a tiny little core intended for power scalability. This is a very capable machine, a core level performance. It has a deep front end, it has a wide back end, out of order machine, which is optimized for density and efficient throughput. It comes in four cores on a module with a shared multi-level cache. It is fully ISA and architectural compatible with the performance core. In this illustration, I show the benefits of the P-core and the E-core in the different scenarios. On the left side, we see the single thread performance on a power unconstrained scenario on scalable applications, the combination of higher performance and higher frequency allows this, the P-core to provide up to 50% more performance than the E-core. On the right side, I took, for example, the ultra mobile. Without the hybrid architecture, in order to fit the high constraints, the size and the term and the power envelope of ultra mobile, we can build a four picor processor. At the same power and thermal constraints, using the hybrid architecture, we can take two P cores and eight E cores and build an equivalent processor. This hybrid machine will outperform the P core only machine by more than 50%. Now that we have introduced the, core, the cores, let's have a look at the, the Alder Lake system on a chip. Using the mix of the P cores and the E cores, we were able to build the most scalable family that we ever introduced. It spans all the way from the small package BGA type for ultra mobile, all the way to the LGA socket high-end desktop. Furthermore, the Alder Lake family are leading the industry to a new IO technologies. We have introduced the 16 lane of PCIe Gen 5, which is 2x faster than the PCI Gen 4. We are leading the transition to the new DDR5 by supporting 
all the existing memory technology, DDR5, DDR4, LPDDR5, and LPDDR4. The memory controller has a voltage and frequency scaling, which allow it to optimize power, performance, and speed. How do we achieve that? We do it using a modular design. I've introduced the P-Core and the 4E-Core module with the MLC. They are equivalent and they are interchangeable. We can mix and match any number of, of, any number of these together on a single system on a chip. We have a bigger integrated graphic and a smaller integrated graphic. We have a set of IPs, IO IPs and accelerators and a high-speed interconnect. And base and using all these, we mix and match and build the entire other lake family. When we architected this part, we took ourselves a goal to make it a seamless transition to the market, meaning any software that exists already should work as is out of the box without the need to spe- for special enabling or for the hybrid architecture. The operating system also does not need to have any hard coding. It does not need to have any notion of P-Core and E-Core and what the capabilities are, and it should not be aware of the topology, the number of cores and the arrangement. All the different core types are architecturally exposed to the operating system as logical processors, and the properties of all of them and the smartness, how to use them is built into the hardware. How we do that brings us to the most exciting part of the hybrid architecture, which we call the thread director. By now you probably understand that extracting the most benefit of a hybrid architecture is all about placement. We need to put the right workload on the right core at the right time. In order to do that, we have built this capability directly into the core hardware. We monitor the workloads as they are running nanosecond by nanosecond and collect information of their properties. We provide feedback to the operating system and the scheduler how to use the cores We dynamically update this information as condition change, the load of the work or the physical power and thermal uh, conditions. We made the power and energy management of the core hybrid aware with deep and intimate knowledge of the voltage frequencies, scaling the size of the cores and the individual topologies. Let's now dive one step deeper and see how the thread director works. This chart shows a distribution of many, many applications and the IPC to IPC ratio between the P-core and the E-core. One means that they are equal in IPC and numbers higher than one means that the P-core outperforms the E-core. We have built a machine learning based predictor that tracks the software as it runs in the microarchitecture, nanosecond by nanosecond, and generates a prediction. It runs on one core and predicts the ratio to the other core. We then take this value and bucket it into four classes. Class zero is the mainstream of application. You see that this is the bigger bucket. This is where most of the applications are, legacy applications are. These are the numeric manipulation, uh, data movement, and, and so on. You can see here the claim that I previously said that the E-Core is a very capable processor. You see that the ratio between the P-Core and the E-Core on the mainstream applications is about one generation of processor. This is a very capable processor. Where the P-Core shines is on the emerging workloads, is on the wide vectors, on the machine learning accelerator, and so on. There, the ratio of IPC to IPC can reach much higher numbers. Class three is the type of workloads like busy loops and memory bound application, which are not dependent on the processor and it doesn't matter where they will run, they will run the same time. 
we take this class value and we store it in the thread context, meaning that the operating system swap the thread in and out. The operating system also have observability for each thread, what class it belongs to. And it uses this class in the scheduling process. Another feedback that we create for the operating system is a table that is called Intel SDM, the HFI table. This is a table that we have built based on the intimate knowledge of the processor, the voltage frequency curves, the properties of the E core and the P core and so on. This table contains two columns for each class, one for performance and one for energy efficiency. The semantics, the value in the table in the performance core is performance capability, and in the efficiency column, it's the energy efficiency of the core. There is one row for each processor. You can see here that there is no such thing as E-core and P-core as far as the operating system or the architecture concern. There can be any number of different types of cores. Each core can be different than all others, and each one of them is enumerated with a value that says what is its performance and what is the energy efficiency of this core. It does not have to be that the E-core is always more energy efficient and the P-core is more performance. For example, on class two, the performance of the P-core is much higher than the E-core. Energy is a multiplication of power by time. So if the time saved by running on the P-core is more than the power saved by running on the E-core, then on class two, the P-core may also be the more energy efficient. The values here may change as the condition change. For instance, if we are highly power and thermal constrained and we need to lower the frequency, we may get to a point where the E-core becomes more performance than the P-core in a very constrained condition. So this is runtime feedback to the operating system, fully enumerating what is the capabilities of the different cores. A zero value in the column means do not schedule. Obviously, if there is an affinity, then the operating system will schedule the thread there. But sometimes it is more efficient to consolidate software thread to less to a smaller number of cores. Sometimes it is more efficient to consolidate all of them on one type of cores, only on the E cores or the P cores, and so on. So all these intelligence is built into the hardware and the firmware of the thread director. Note that this table is updated much slower than the, the classification of threads. The classification is updated every schedule window. This one is looking at the wider observation window, does some statistics over time and generates this feedback. When the operating system comes to schedule a new thread and need to make a decision where to schedule it. It reads the HFI table. The operating system has the notion of the priority of a thread. The operating system knows if a certain thread is high priority, it's background, it is user interactive, or it is low priority. If an operating system tries to schedule a high priority thread, it will look at the performance column pick the highest performance value, just sort it, and schedule on the highest priority core, which is available for scheduling. And if it's a background or low priority, it will look at the energy efficient column and choose the one with the lowest value that is available for scheduling. So all the directives of which core is more efficient or more performance is communicated through the hardware HF EHFI table and no hard coded is needed in the operating system. The topology also is built into this table. So any number or any combination of core count is supported by this table. Let's have a, 
an example and see how this works in, in real life. And the underlying uh, drawing here is the physical cores of, of Alder Lake, the E cores and the P cores. The top uh, layer is the operating system. And in between, we have the thread director and with the EHFI table built into it. At a certain given time, the operating system may have many, uh, many applications in the ready queue, ready to be scheduled. Each one of them has a class, as we mentioned, as part of its context, and the operating system knows which is foreground and what, which is background. When the operating system is about to schedule a background task, it will look at the energy efficiency column of the EHFI table and redirect it to the most energy efficient core. In this example, it would be the E core. When it scheduled a high priority, any class and there are cores available, then it will schedule them on the performance core based on the performance column. Usually it would be the P core. Now things start to be interesting and need the support of the hardware when there is a contention, when there are more threads competing for, let's say, the P core, then there are actually available P cores. In this case, the operating system will look at the classes and prioritize them. Class one and two have priority over class zero. So if all the, if the performing core are uh, taken by class zero and class one or two need, arrives and needs to be scheduled, the operating system will migrate it to a less performing core. In this case, in this example, it will be an E core and schedule the class two on a P core. So here, this is, measurement that we have took in the lab, they are not official and are not to scale, it's just to illustrate where the thread director brings the value. Obviously, if all threads are symmetrical, it doesn't matter where we schedule. Any naive scheduling like first come, first save will work equally, equally good. When there, there is asymmetry between the threads, then the thread director brings the value. Here, the green bar shows Excel with, with uh, Office AI. Excel is a class, one, class zero application, number, number uh, calculations and data manipulation and pointer chasing. And uh, AI is a type two machine learning. And we see that when we compare random scheduling with the first come first serve to a thread director based scheduling, putting the AI on the P core and the number calculation, the class zero on the, on the E core, we get a significant performance improvement. And the other bars show other uh, combination. Uh, the blue and the orange show class zero with class one or two. Uh, which, which give priority to class one and two over class zero on the P cores. And the yellow one is class one and class three, where we direct the class three to the E core, making room for class one and freeing up uh, power and thermal and energy resources to, for the other threads. On Alder Lake, we re-architected the power and energy management in order to make it performance hybrid aware. Unlike a power scalability type of hybrid, there is more into it. The power management algorithm has an intimate knowledge of the topology, the core types, the voltage frequency curve, the performance for each of the different cores, it is made aware of the type of workloads which is running at a certain time on the course. This capability is already built in the Intel speed shift technology since the Lake family. When the operating system schedules a software thread on a core, it schedules it together with a value that is called EPP, Energy Performance Preference. 
that tells the power management algorithm what is the priority of this thread. We have seen in the previous example that on a loaded system, at, at the same time, the E-Corp may be running a mix of high priority and low priority threads, and the P-Corp also may, run, may be running high and low priority threads. When we come to balance power budget between cores or between threads, we need to be aware of the, of the priority. That means that the low priority threads will be running at a lower voltage, lower frequency, and the higher priority will be running at higher voltage, higher frequency, regardless whether it is a P core and an E core. When we balance power budget between P cores and E cores, the optimal voltage frequency point is a function of the performance and the physical pro properties of the cores. And obviously when we are running low priority or class three types of workloads, we can run the, the cores at a low voltage frequency point and conserve energy. questions and uh, based on some voting, we have uh, a few interesting questions. So the first question was from AMD, Elliot from AMD. So he was asking what the security implication of a thread director as a side channel was. So could you answer that, Effie? Say that again, sorry. So what are the security security implication of a thread director as a side channel? It's a question from Elliot from AMD. The thread director impacts performance. So side channels affect also, uh, I'm not saying that they are, but if there is something, then it, they only impact performance and not uh, for the security. Okay, thank you for the answer. And the second question, the uh, second popular question was about the die photo and the PCIEs. And uh, which die is uh, someone from, someone was asking how many PCI three, four, five uh, lanes for different types of uh, Elder Lake dies. From, as, as shown in the presentation, the uh, on point uh, 11, we have 16 lanes of PCI Gen 5 and 4 PCI Gen 4 coming out of the zone. And on the desktop, we have a PCI which has an additional extension. Okay, that's great. And the uh, last question. So Charlie from Semi Accurate was asking whether PD or thread director will be available for Linux, and if so, what kind of and when? Um, our first enablement was with Windows 11. The, we are doing our work, we have been doing work for some time with the Linux. Exactly which it is coming. Exactly which uh, version and which build we will publish closer to the All right. Thank you. And uh, let me move on to the second presentation then. The second presentation is from AMD, and the speaker will present the next generation Gen 3 core architecture designed to provide the scale up performance for servers, data centers, and the supercomputers. And uh, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Mark Eber. Mark is a senior fellow at AMD, where he has contributed to many processor designs over the last two decades holding a variety of roles in physical design, RTR, and the microarchitecture. Most recently, he was the lead architect for the Gen 3 core, and he holds a PhD in computer science engineering from University of Michigan. 
Now, Mark will start his presentation. When you use your computer, you want smooth frame rates for gaming and fast processing that makes the computer feel like an extension of you. With the next generation Zen 3 core, we're delivering another large increase in CPU performance for gamers, content creators, high performance computing, and more. I'm Mark Evers, the lead core architect for Zen 3, and I feel incredibly privileged that I get to tell you about this core on behalf of a large and very talented team. We started the Zen line of course with the release of Zen in early 2017 with a ground up redesign. With over 50% increase in IPC and a new SOC architecture based on a four core complex, this marked a new era in the market for AMD. The Zen 2 design built on this with higher frequencies, more IPC, a larger L3 cache, larger floating point unit in a new seven nanometer process. And then late last year and continuing into this year, we launched a seven nanometer Zen 3 core products. Zen 3 is based around a new eight core complex. It delivers a big performance uplift through both frequency and IPC and has doubled int 8 throughput and an innovative new set of L3 cache solutions, including support for stacked AMD 3DV cache. With large IPC improvements in every generation, we are well exceeding past industry trends. When we started the Zen 3 design, we were ready to aggressively redesign the architecture to deliver another landmark increase in 1T performance through IPC and frequency, and to unify the cores and the cache in a contiguous eight core complex to improve effective latency and provide scale out performance for servers, data centers, and supercomputers. We also wanted to introduce new ISA extensions and expanded security features and the support for the AMD 3D vCache integration. And we wanted to do all of this while enabling platform level scaling and energy efficiency while maintaining socket compatibility with past products to simplify the upgrade cycle for our partners and customers. Zen 3 was a grounds up design that included a thorough reimagining of many of the pipelines and functional units. The diagram on the right shows the Zen 3 microarchitecture and we'll go into more detail on that in the later slides, but first some of the high level characteristics. Zen 3 supports simultaneous multi-threading to get that extra performance in an energy efficient manner when additional threads of work are available. The flow of instructions through the pipeline starts on the top right with the state-of-the-art branch predictor feeding a sequence of addresses to the front end of the core. Instructions are then fetched and decoded four instructions per cycle from the 32 kilobyte iCache or eight ops per cycle from the opcache that can hold 4,000 instructions. The resulting ops are placed into the op queue. They're then dispatched up to six ops per cycle to the integer or floating point schedulers. And to execute the ops, there are four integer units plus dedicated branch and store data units. We support three address generations per cycle and also additional floating point resources, including the capability for two vector floating point multiply accumulates per cycle. The load store unit has a 32K dcache supporting three memory ops per cycle backed by a half megabyte L2. And the instruction and data level one TLBs hold 64 entries each, backed by a 512 entry level two structure for instructions and a 2K entry for data. Now this all adds up to a 19% IPC uplift for Zen 3. That's the third consecutive generation with a double digit IPC gain and the largest gain since the original Zen core. And that's in addition to the frequency uplift. The size of the bars on the right shows the approximate contribution of each part of the design to the overall improvement. And you can see that to get an improvement this large, 
we had to significantly redesign logic throughout the core with performance contributions from just about every corner of the chip. And one of the largest chunks of that extra performance came from the front end of the core. We reduced the minimum mispredict latency, one of the most important latencies in the core by up to three cycles. Even a very good branch predictor will be wrong sometimes, and this helps us get back on track faster when that happens. We also reduce the prediction latencies for taken branches, so there's no lost bubble cycle in most cases. The TH predictor configuration was optimized, and we moved more of the BTB storage in closer to the first level for more consistent performance with larger footprint code. The target predictor for indirect branches was doubled in size, and the, L the 32K L1 iCache has improved prefetching, leading to better utilization. Also, the relationship between the iCache and the opcache was reworked to process opcache f fetches faster and better handle the cases that switch back and forth between the opcache and iCache. Overall, this makes for faster fetch, especially for branchy and large footprint code. We introduced a new distributed integer scheduler organization to support better scheduler efficiency and wider execution issue. Some instruction latencies were reduced and we support a larger out of order window through the increased register file, scheduler, and reorder buffer sizes. Finally, the peak issue bandwidth, what some may call PICs, was increased from seven to 10. All in all, this gives us more execution bandwidth and the ability to extract more instruction level parallelism to feed it. Now I just mentioned that we increased the number of integer pick, ops picked per cycle from seven to 10. But if you do this in the straightforward way of just adding more general purpose ALUs, it can be really costly. So to accomplish this as efficiently as possible, we kept four ALUs and three AGUs, but we added new branch and store data units at a smaller cost, offloading the more expensive ALUs so they could focus on doing the operations that needed their full capabilities. Since the new units do not produce register results, this was done without any increase in register file write ports or growth in the register bypass network. The new distributed scheduler organization also allowed for more uniform use of the capacity across a variety of workloads. On the floating point size, we increased the dispatch bandwidth to six ops per cycle into a larger 64 entry scheduler. We have two multiply units and two add units, but we also added separate float to end and store data movement units to get more out of the main functional units. And we grew the scheduler to help extract parallelism to feed them. The main units are all 256 bit wide. We shortened the latency for the important floating point multiply accumulate instruction to four cycles to speed up execution. And we doubled the number of units that support int eight ops to speed up workloads using those. Staying with the theme of larger structures, on the load and store side, we also grew the store queue to 64 entries. We improved our prefetchers especially focusing on better prefetch on page crossings and better coordination between the L1 and L2 cache prefetching. And we also provided a little better configurability for the prefetcher. The load store unit supports three memory op accesses per cycle to the 32K data cache. All can be loads, but max two can be stores with some additional restrictions for floating point loads and stores. The 2K entry L2 DTLB has six page table walkers for those cases when you're still missing. 
This may seem like a lot, but a few workloads that randomly access data from a very large data set can generate a lot of concurrent TLB misses, so this helps those workloads. And to round it out, we sped up execution of short string copies and improved our handling of stored to load dependencies. Now, after that detailed walkthrough, I'd like to summarize Zen 3 in a different way by looking at what changed the most from Zen 2. This really doesn't capture everything since many of the units were redesigned in a much more comprehensive way, but it still gives a good feel for the differences. On the front end, we doubled the size of the L1 BTB. We improved the bandwidth of the branch predictor in part by removing the, the bubble cycle that often occurs with taken branch predictions. We sped up the recovery from mispredict so that even when in those cases when the very accurate branch predictor did mispredict still, we could get back on track faster. And we sped up the sequencing of opcache fetches so you could get fetch faster from the opcache. But we also made for quicker switching between the opcache and iCache pipes so that when you had a moderately large footprint code that didn't fit in the opcache, you can handle those transitions better. On the execution side, we added the de dedicated branch and store data pickers and built a larger window to extract instruction level parallelism out of. We also reduced the latency of some select ops that also helps extract more parallelism out of the code. On the floating point side, also going wider to six wide dispatch an issue and faster latency on the FMAC instruction. For load store, we have higher load bandwidth, we have higher store bandwidth, and more flexibility in how you can mix those load and store ops in the pipelines. We improved the memory dependence detection for those cases where a load is close together with the store that, that creates the data that it needs. And we increased the number of page table blockers to support TLB messes. But the real reason for the microarchitectural changes was to deliver more performance. And we're very excited about the 19% IPC improvement over Zen 2. 19% is a geometric mean across 25 workloads, but as you can see on the right side of the chart, some top gaming titles got more than 30% IPC improvement. Now let's talk about the support for new software features in Zen 3. At AMD, security remains foundational in our designs. Zen 3's Infinity Guard security feature adds strong additional layers to our security offering. In the first generation epic, secure encrypted virtualization enabled encrypted memory for each virtual machine to protect confidential info. In the second generation, we added SEVES to protect the virtual machine control registers on the CPU from being compromised. And now with Zen 3 and the third generation epic, we add secure nested paging to protect data in use at the virtual machine level. Secure nested paging is a new layer of protection in a multi-tenant cloud. It eliminates additional attack vectors through the page tables, meaning that the cloud provider's hypervisor controller can't see into the virtual machines or make changes to the tenant. This protects data in use, even from cloud administrators. Moreover, all these confidential computing capabilities can be seamlessly implemented as a lift and shift with no application modification needed. We'll continue our priority focus on security and plan to add more hardening of AMD security offerings going forward. Zen 3 also adds support for several new instruction set features. All Zen 3 products get support for new 256-bit encryption and decryption extensions, doubling the data size for those operations, and for memory protection keys to provide additional user-level controls for access protections, and 
a shadow stack for protection against return-oriented programming-based security attacks. For server, I already covered the new extensions to AMD Infinity Card protection with secure nested paging, and we also added a few more SEDES enhancements. In addition, servers get support for broadcast page table invalidations through the new Inval page B instruction and support for process context IDs to reduce TLB flush requirements. SOCs using Zen 3 cores also have many innovations in the L3 cache architecture that help take performance to the next level. This picture shows the difference in the core complex architecture between the Zen 2 and Zen 3 designs. The Zen 3 core complex was re-architected to be based on eight cores sharing an L3 instead of four. This doubles the amount of L3 cache that's directly accessible from a given core and accelerates core and cache-to-cache -cache communication for gaming and other workloads. This organization results in a reduction in effective memory latency by reducing the amount of L3 misses, L3 misses, especially for workloads with a fair amount of data sharing. As part of this transformation, we incorporated a new bidirectional ring bus. This is a more scalable design and the bidirectional nature helps keep latencies low by giving more flexibility in how to route commands and data between CPU cores and the L3 with two 32-byte data channels going in opposite directions, we deliver high bandwidth access to the L3 banks in a power-efficient manner while keeping latency low. Looking a bit deeper at the Zen 3 cache hierarchy, the picture on the right shows a different way to represent it, showing again how eight cores connect to a shared L3 cache. I already covered the L1 and L2 cache capabilities in the earlier slides, but an important characteristic of the L3 cache is that it's filled from L2 victims rather than on all L1 and L2 fills. This helps improve utilization over an inclusive design. The L2 tags are duplicated in the L3 cache to facilitate faster cache transfers, and so we don't need to send probe requests for misses to the L2 cache. We support up to 64 outstanding L2 misses per core and 192 misses from L3 to memory. But perhaps the most exciting part about the L3 cache is the built-in support for the AMD 3D V cache. We have demonstrated the 3D V cache on a prototype 12 core processor based on Zen 3. In addition to the 32 meg L3 on the base die, an additional stacked 64 megabyte L3 brings the total up to 96 megabytes per CCD, or a staggering 192 megabytes total. This is enabled using through silicon vias that are present in the Zen 3 CCD and a direct copper to copper bond with a stacked memory. Again, we don't do technology just for the sake of technology. This delivers serious performance on the prototype we demonstrated an average 15% improvement across many PC games, five of which are shown here. That is the kind of IPC uplift you would expect to see from a full core generation. Now those were some exciting performance numbers, but I wanna share a little more about what products you can find Zen 3 in and what kind of performance and power efficiency they deliver. The first products that were launched with Zen 3 cores are the AMD Ryzen 5000 series mobile processors with unprecedented performance and battery life and the pro version of those mobile processors delivering multi-layered security features to help provide protection at every level from silicon to OS. And then the 5000 series desktop processor, processors 
delivering up to 26% gaming performance generational uplift, and the third generation AMD EPIC server processors, delivering world record performance and advanced security features with AMD Infinity Guard. And speaking of those world records, when we launched the second generation EPIC processors, we were able to show over 80 world records across a wide range of applications and workloads. That's pretty good. But now after the launch of the third generation EPIC with Zen 3, EPIC has over 200 world records across nearly every type of application, workload, and customer, including databases, cloud, enterprise, and high-performance computing. That's a testament to the performance that the third generation EPIC family brings. And Zen 3 also improved performance per watt over the prior generation. We remained in the same seven nanometer technology as Zen 2, so this improvement was all due to better architectural efficiency and physical design optimizations. This chart shows system performance per watt running Cinebench R20 multi-threaded tests for competing gaming processors using similarly configured systems. The Zen 3 based systems have around 10 to 25% performance per watt advantage over the Zen 2 systems and a much larger advantage over systems using a competing processor. But this is where I get really excited. Gaming performance was one of the main targets for the Zen 3 design. It's all about delivering performance that matters to the user. And that's the end result of the enhancements in and around Zen 3. As we stayed in the same seven nanometer technology as the prior Zen 2 generation, these improvements are all down to the new architecture and physical design optimizations. The 19% IPC uplift, access to a larger portion of the L3 cache per core, higher frequencies across the stack, and a unified eight core complex all together add up to great gaming performance. As the chart shows, it adds up to an approximately 26% average gaming improvement and as high as 50% on some games. And this is without a 3 dB cache. So to summarize, we got a 19% IPC uplift in client workloads higher frequencies across the desktop family, lower effective latency with the eight core complex, better power efficiency, an industry first prototype demo of copper to copper die stack cache, and a slew of new server world records along with the next generation security features. We feel we solidly met our main design goals for the Zen 3 core with leadership gaming and server performance. And it doesn't stop there. As excited as we are about how Zen 3 turned out, we are focused on delivering another solid improvement with a five nanometer Zen 4, which is on track. To build a product like this takes an awesome team. I want to extend a big thank you to the AMD Quartz team and all of the other AMD teams that made Zen 3 possible. This was a really gigantic team effort and Zen 3 came to fruition through their hard work. Thank you for listening in and I believe we have time for some questions. great talk. Now it's the Q&A session and we have a lot of questions here. Because of the time limit, I mean, I don't think we can do this for all the questions, but one popular question was whether the B-cache 
is applicable to all the segments, or is it just for the, the server or desktop? This question was from uh, how it's getting and how it works. Yeah, so there are a lot of different workloads that can really benefit from the larger vCache. It's obviously a little different from, um, from program to program. We haven't actually announced the specific products that will have a AMD 3D vCache yet. So I can't tell you exactly which products will be out there, but we do see some workloads across many different segments that, that benefit uh, greatly from that larger cache. And then let me move on to the second question. So this question is from BJ at Pen. And the, what is the primary motivation for tripling the number of those table workers in Gen 3? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, actually one that I hear internally a couple of times too. So there are a few workloads that have a really large random access type of memory footprint where you actually do see quite a fair bit of um, outstanding TLB misses at the same time where you can get that extra benefit. Now, obviously a lot of different workloads that you run will not need any more than a, a couple of page table walkers, but we did see that benefit in a few places and we figured out a clever way, I'd say, of getting that many without paying a huge cost for it. So we decided why not give that extra opportunity for those places that do benefit from it. Okay, thank you for the answer. And the third question was from Carlos. He was asking whether this treatment technology is a skill. I said we have to have more and more treatment and he is uh, concerned about power and the latency when we have to increase the more treatment. So yeah, so uh, I, I think there are a couple of different places that question could be going. So let me answer it based on my understanding of it. Uh, but um, when it comes to the 3D V cache, the extra latency to the L3 cache is not particularly large. Uh, I don't have a specific number I'm going to quote here. Uh, but also when it comes to the chiplet technology of having different CCDs and IO dies to cover the um, to cover different functionality uh, in some ways it can actually give you more flexibility than the uh, the monolithic design so it uh, doesn't have to increase latency significantly or power for that matter in general we find that um, we can build you know basically the best products we can build with chiplet and uh, that's covering all of the different trade-offs. Thank you. And uh, one question was about the physical core size comparison between Gen 2 core and the Gen 3 cores. Can you make a comment on that? Yeah, and I don't recall if we published anything specifically on that, so I'm not going to give you an exact number there. Uh, I'd say it was a, you know, fairly modest increase in in size it's uh, definitely larger uh, but it's not like a gigantic growth so most of the extra benefits that we unlocked like the 19 percent ipc and the extra frequency that didn't come at the cost of some gigantic growth in area okay so i think we have uh, enough trainings in this session and uh, let me move on to the next is presentation. So the third presentation is from IBM, and the speaker will present the IBM talent process on optimized for real-time AI for enterprise workloads. We introduce our speaker, Dr. Christian Jacobi. Christian received his master and the PhD in computer science from Southern University in Germany in 1999 and 2002. He joined IBM in its uh, some German location and development in 2002 and then relocated to New York in 2007. In his almost three years with IBM, uh, he had worked 
roaming IBM processors, including the Cell process of Power 6, 9, and 10, and the last five generations of uh, IBM Z processors. Currently, Dr. Jacobi serves as the chief architect for process design for IBM Z and the Linux one. Now, Christian will start his presentation. Let me ask you a question. How often have you used the mainframe today? Did you use your credit card to pay for your morning coffee or order something online? Did you go grocery shopping or get money from an ATM? Then probably you've used an IBM Z system today. Hi, my name is Christian Jacobi. I'm the chief architect for Z processor design. And today I'm introducing the IBM Telem chip Telem is the next generation processor for IBM Z and Linux One systems. It's a very exciting moment for me to be able to talk about this chip publicly for the first time. I've seen this chip grow up from, from rough ideas in the concept phase through high level design and the ups and downs of implementing the chip. And now that it's working well on the test floor and we can talk about it here at Hot Chips, it's just a major milestone for the project and for me personally. The Telem design is focused on enterprise class workloads. And it provides the necessary performance and availability and security, but it also has a new feature with a built-in AI accelerator geared towards enabling our clients to gain real-time insights from their data as it's getting processed. I'll talk you through all those details, but before I do that, let me give you a little bit of background around IBM Z. As you can probably tell from my initial questions, IBM Z systems are a central part of large enterprises' IT infrastructure in industries like banking, retail, and logistics. But not only large enterprises in those kinds of industries are using IBM Z, the same capabilities are getting exploited by startup companies in new areas like digital asset custody. Enterprise workloads are an ever-evolving mix of established technologies and new technologies. Take languages for an example. It's not uncommon for an enterprise workload to be composed of programs written in COBOL, Java, and Python, and Node.js. Enterprise workloads combine traditional on-prem data hosting with OpenShift-based hybrid cloud. And they are combining traditional transaction and batch processing with artificial intelligence. That latter point is particularly interesting. Increasingly, enterprises are using the data they own and process to gain insights with AI models, insights they can then use to optimize their businesses. The IBM Telem chip is designed for such mission-critical workloads, enabling enhancements in both the traditional aspects of enterprise computing and AI capabilities. Let me talk you through some of the details on the attributes that are traditionally associated with enterprise workloads. First, there's performance and scale. Enterprise workloads are very sensitive to per-thread performance, meaning the ability to finish every single task very quick. And they are also very sensitive to scalability so that they can scale up to the sheer number of tasks thrown at those systems every second. The Telem chip has an optimized core pipeline and a brand new cache hierarchy and a new multi-chip fabric that I'm going to describe in detail. Enterprise workloads are very heterogeneous. Banking workloads are very different from, say, logistics workloads. And even within those workloads, there are very heterogeneous kinds of programs. There are some common types of operations that happen across a wide range of applications. For example, data sorting, compression, and cryptography. IBM Z has a long history of implementing hardware accelerators for such tasks in cooperation with the firmware and software team to enable best possible end-to-end -end value from those accelerators. Like I already mentioned, we are now implementing a new AI accelerator, and we have re-optimized all the existing accelerators to work perfectly in harmony with the new cache hierarchy and, and fabric design. Of course, enterprise workloads are also very sensitive to security. Uh, and the IBM Telem chip implements a number of innovations in that regard as well. We now implement encrypted memory, and we have a performance-improved trusted execution environment. 
The trusted execution environment enables clients to run containerized workloads in a way such that the hardware ensures that the system administrators and the hypervisor administrators cannot get to the data in those containers. That obviously aligns very well with a hybrid cloud operational model. Last but not least, enterprise workloads and mission critical workloads need best possible reliability and availability. The IBM Z15 predecessor chip already provided seven lines of availability. And with the Telem chip, we're driving the ball forward through a number of enhancements. For example, with a new error correction and sparing mechanism that can recover data even when an entire L2 cache SRAM array has a wipeout error. We can transparently correct the data and we can then implement a spare array without the software even noticing. I'll take you now on a small journey through the chip to talk a little bit more about how the Telem processor achieves the performance and scalability enhancements before I come back to the AI capabilities. Let's start with the eight cores and L2 caches per chip. We have optimized the core for best possible performance, and we are investing a lot of silicon real estate into that per core performance. For example, through a very deep high frequency out of order pipeline and very large structures like the branch prediction tables and the caches. The out of order pipeline can run with a base frequency of more than five gigahertz and implements SMT2. There's a number of enhancements that went into the core pipeline. One of the bigger ones is the redesigned branch prediction. We have now an integrated first and second level branch prediction pipeline, which allows us to access the second level BTB with lower latency when branches are not found in the first level branch prediction. We also implement a new mechanism called dynamic branch prediction entry reconfiguration. That allows us to vary the number of branches we can store in each table entry based on how many branches are in any given instruction cache line and whether those branches are going far or staying nearby. Depending on that, we need few or more bits uh, to store the branch target address. And based on that, we can then put more or fewer branches into the branch prediction tables. With that design, we achieve more than 270,000 branch targets that we can keep in every single course branch prediction tables. That sheer size is a testament to the scale of these enterprise workloads. On Z15, we implemented shared physical level three caches on the processor chip, and we had a separate cache chip that implemented a large level four cache. On the Telem chip, we are implementing all of that logic in a single chip, and we opted to quadruple the L2 cache to 32 megabytes. Of course, the L2 access latency is very important for the performance of enterprise workloads, so we spent a lot of engineering effort to get that latency as low as we could, and we achieved a 19-cycle load use latency. That's roughly 3.8 nanoseconds, which already includes the access to the 7,000 entry TLB. We have four pipelines in the L2 that allow overlapping traffic so that the performance of the L2 does not bog down under load. Now I mentioned the shared level three and level four caches that we had on the Z15 generation. On the Telem generation, we don't have those as physical caches anymore. Instead, we are building virtual level three and level four caches from the private L2 caches. And overall, we can provide 1.5x the cache per core at improved latencies compared to Z15. From a software perspective and software performance perspective, it still feels like a traditional cache hierarchy, even though everything is built from the L2 caches. That's an important aspect to drive a consistent workload performance gain uh, across a wide range of workloads with the Telem chip. Let me describe in a little bit more detail how we achieve these virtual level three and level four caches. First, we are interconnecting all the L2 caches on the chip with a ring infrastructure that supports more than 320 gigabytes per second of ring bandwidth. Then based on that infrastructure, we are implementing what we call on-chip horizontal cache persistence. What that means is that when one L2 evicts a cache line, it can look around on the chip to find a less busy L2 and push the cache line into that other L2 so that it stays close by on the chip should the workload come back to that data, it's accessible very quickly uh, with on-chip latencies. That way we achieve a 256 megabyte distributed cache on the chip 
with an average latency of only 12 nanoseconds. That is faster than the physical L3 that we had on Z15. We then apply the same mechanism across multiple chips. We can group up to eight uh, Telum chips and form a virtual two gigabyte level four cache across those eight chips. So let me describe a little bit how we are using the Telum chip to build out a large scale system. Of course, we start with a single chip with its 256 megabyte cache. The Telum chip is designed to fit on a dual chip module. So there are two chips with 512 megabytes cache on one module. Four of those modules get plugged into a four socket drawer. Think of the drawer as the motherboard that can hold four of those dual chip modules. So that gives us eight chips and the virtual level four cache of two gigabytes. And then up to four of those drawers can be interconnected into a system uh, with up to 32 chips and eight gigabytes of cache, forming one large scale coherent shared memory system that enables the scale that our clients most demanding workloads need. All of that is enabled with the fabric controllers and the cross-chip interfaces that are on the perimeter of the chip. There are latency and bandwidth improvements compared to the prior generation uh, along that entire buildup from single chip to the full system. I'll just mention two here. The dual chip module uses a two cycle uh, transfer path between the sending chip and the receiving chip, meaning we can send data out of one chip and receive it in a latch on the other chip with just a two to one clock in between. We achieve that by having perfectly synchronized clock grids on the two chips um, of the DCM. I already mentioned that on Z15, we had a dedicated cache chip and that cache chip also was a hub whenever two processor chips needed to communicate with, with each other, which led to a little bit of added latency through that hub chip. Now having everything combined into the Telum chip, we can implement a completely flat topology within the drawer, meaning every one of the eight processor chips in a drawer has a direct connection to every other chip in the drawer. That further reduces the latency of that large virtual level four cache. Taking all of these enhancements together, the improved fabric controls and on-drawer interfaces, uh, the core design and the cache hierarchy, we can achieve over 40% per socket performance growth. That's the kind of performance growth our clients need to keep up with the increase in their workloads. I spend a lot of time describing the details of how we achieve the performance and scale. I now want to switch gears and talk more about the embedded accelerators and specifically the accelerator for AI. But before I go into the details of the AI accelerator, I want to spend a little bit of time to explain the use cases that we're going after and that we're shaping some of the design decisions. When I look at enterprise workloads and AI use cases, they roughly fall into two categories. The first category is what I would label business insights, where clients can use AI on their business data to derive insights they then use to improve their businesses. Examples include fraud detection on credit cards, customer behavior prediction, or supply chain optimization. The second category I would label as intelligent infrastructure, where AI algorithms are used to make the machine more efficient. Examples include intelligent workload placement in an operating system, database query plan optimization, or anomaly detection for security. Let's take credit card processing as an example, and specifically credit card fraud detection. We know from our conversations with clients that when they try to do that with an off-platform inference engine, that they cannot achieve the low latency and the consistency of low latency by sending data from IBM Z to a separate platform. Also, when sending data to a separate platform, it creates all sorts of security concerns. That data, after all, is sensitive and often personal. And so the data needs to be encrypted, the security standards need to be audited, and those things create additional complexity in an enterprise environment. So based on that, we know from our clients that they would much rather have the ability to run AI directly embedded into the transaction workload directly on IBM Z. That way, they can score every transaction 100% of the time with the best available model that they want to use for that task. For that reason, we chose to implement a centralized on-chip accelerator directly shared by all the cores. Let me talk you through some of the attributes that this design point provides us and compare that to those basic use cases. 
First of all, I mentioned we need very low and just as important, very consistent inference latency. By having the accelerator accessible by every single core, when the core switches back and forth between non-AI work and AI work, it has the ability to use the entire compute capacity of the AI, AI accelerator for when it does perform AI work. That's different from most other server processors that are implementing some AI capabilities directly in their vector execution units. In that design point, when workload switches back and forth between AI and non-AI work, the AI work can only get the portion of the total capacity that is belonging to that core. In our design point, the entire centralized accelerator's capability is available to every core when it needs it. Second, we had to optimize the AI accelerator's compute capacity to match up the total transaction capacity of the Telem chip. We want our clients to be enabled to perform AI inference as part of every transaction, so we needed to implement sufficient compute capacity for that. The centralized AI accelerator provided us with some amount of flexibility on floor planning and where we place the accelerator on the chip, and also how much area we can devote to the accelerator. Between those two considerations, we implemented the AI accelerator with more than six teraflops of compute capacity. We also know from our clients that they are using a wide range of different types of AI models, ranging from traditional machine learning models, like decision trees, to various types of neural networks. We designed the accelerator to provide acceleration to the operational types that occur in those different types of AI models. I already mentioned the importance of security and how we are avoiding sending data off platform with the built-in accelerator. But of course, it's also important to follow the strong memory virtualization and protection mechanisms that IBM Z on its cores implements. I'll describe how we map that from the core directly onto the accelerator. And then last but not least, AI is a fairly new and quickly evolving field, so we designed the accelerator with extensibility in mind. There's a lot of firmware involved in how the accelerator works, and so that enables us to provide updates and new features and functions with new firmware releases in the future. The hardware design of the accelerator also naturally lends itself to enhancements in future generations of silicon. So let me go a little bit more into the details of how the accelerator works. We defined a new instruction called the Neural Network Processing Assist instruction. That instruction is a memory-to-memory -memory CISC instruction, meaning the operands, the tensor data, are directly sitting in user space in a program's memory. So for example, a program could have two matrices sitting in memory and a uh, destination matrix and call the instruction, and the instruction would perform the matrix multiplication of the two source operands and put the result into the destination operand. The instruction can perform many types of operations, like matrix multiplication, pooling, or activation functions. There is firmware running on both the processor core and the AI accelerator. The processor firmware performs all the address translation uh, and translates the program virtual addresses to physical addresses, and it performs also access checking as it performs that translation. That way, we inherit all the natural virtualization and protection capabilities of the core for the AI accelerator. The core also performs prefetching of the tensor data into the L2 cache, so that data is readily available when the accelerator needs it. The firmware sitting on the core and the accelerator are then building a data pipeline that stages the data from the L2 cache into the accelerator and distributes it within the accelerator to gain the maximum efficiency of the compute performance there. Speaking about the compute performance, like I said, we deliver more than six teraflops per chip which provides us with over 200 teraflops in the 32-chip system. The compute capacity comes from two compute arrays. The upper array is the matrix array. It consists of 128 processor tiles, each implementing an eight-way SIMD engine with 16-bit floating-point format. The array is designed as a high-density multiply and accumulate array uh, focused on matrix multiplication and convolution. The second array is the activation array. It consists of 32 processor tiles with an eight-way SIMD for floating point 16. It can also perform FP32 operations. That array is optimized for activation functions and other complex operations like LSTM. In order to make 
the maximum efficient use of the array, we invested a lot into the data flow surrounding the array. We have the intelligent prefetch engine, which is firmware controlled and receives the translated physical addresses from the core and then fetches the data uh, from the L2 cache through the ring into the accelerator and then results go back the same way. It can perform operations on the ring with about 100 gigabytes per second. The data gets loaded into the scratch pad from where it gets distributed into the input and output stages of the compute grid array itself. Along that data path, we have data formatters that ensure that the data arrives at the compute engines in exactly the format and layout that the compute engines need. We can distribute the data with more than 600 gigabytes per second. And through all the firmware coordination between the core, all these data movers, and the compute array itself, we maximize the compute efficiency of that compute grid. Let me step back out from the accelerator and talk about the software ecosystem that enables the exploitation of this accelerator. There's a broad and open software ecosystem that enables our clients to build and train models anywhere, meaning they can build their models on IBM Z, they can build their models on IBM Power Systems, or they can build their models on any other system. They can use the tools that their data scientists are already familiar with. You see a lot of familiar logos on this page. And then the trained models can be exported into the open neural network exchange format. And then the IBM Deep Learning compiler can take the Onyx model and compile and optimize the model for direct execution on the AI accelerator. On the right side, you see a typical enterprise stack consisting of the operating system and container platform, databases, app servers, and applications. As I already mentioned, there are use cases for AI at every layer in that stack. The operating system can benefit from AI for intelligent workload placement. Databases can optimize their query plans. And then, of course, at the application layer, uh, clients can embed AI into their transactions for things like credit card fraud detection or supply chain optimization. I did talk a lot about the goal of achieving low latency so that AI can be embedded real time and at scale without slowing down transactions. So we built a number of models in cooperation with our clients, proxy models that reflect real world applications of AI inferencing. On this chart, I'm showing one example. This is a recurring neural network that we co-developed with a global bank to reflect their credit card fraud scoring models. And we ran that model on a single Telem chip, and we can run more than 100,000 inferences every second with a latency of only 1.1 millisecond. And then as we scale that system up from one chip to two, up to eight and 32 chips, we can perform inference on more than 3.5 million tasks, and the latency still stays very low at only 1.2 milliseconds. Now this is only running the AI inference tasks. We are not actually running the credit card transaction workload. But it does show that Telem's AI accelerator has the capacity to provide low latency real-time inference at massive scale so that it can be directly embedded into the transactions at very high bandwidth. Let me summarize. I introduced the Telem processor chip for the next generation of IBM Z and Linux One systems. I explained in some detail how the Telem chip achieves the performance and scale enhancements. And for lack of time, I only gave a few examples on how the Telem chip also improves the security and availability characteristics. And then I described in some detail how the embedded AI accelerator will enable our clients to embed AI directly into their enterprise workloads. Of course, this chip is the work of a very large team spanning the globe, and spanning multiple groups inside IBM, from the IBM system chip development team to the IBM research division. Our technology development partner on this project is Samsung. We are manufacturing the Telem chip in Samsung's seven nanometer EUV technology. The entire team is very excited to see this chip come to life. And we can't wait to see how our clients will benefit from all the capabilities we put into the Telem chip. Thank you very much for your attention, and we now have a few minutes for questions and answers. Okay, so 
thank you for the great talk, Christian. We also have uh, many questions here, and since we have some time, let me go through one by one. So the first question is from Perry. So does data movement use the ring for the AI accelerator, or is there some other bus? So the AI accelerator accesses the data um, that, it, that it pulls from the caches through the ring infrastructure. Uh, that way we achieve the low latency data access for when the core is already processing data and the data sits naturally in the caches, we can pull that data directly into the AI accelerator. Uh, the firmware then manages you know, putting that data in the right place uh, in the scratch pad and then distributing it within the accelerator through dedicated buses into the input and output FIFOs that are surrounding the computer arrays. Uh, so it, the answer is a little bit of both. The firmware manages the, 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 uh, the transportation of the data within the accelerator, and then we use the ring for, for bringing data in and out of the accelerator. All right, thank you. And uh, one question from Tao Zhang at Alibaba. What's the packaging technology used to connect the dual dice in a module? It's, uh, it's a fairly standard technology. There's no bridges or something like that. We just um, really put these two chips very close together. They have less than a, uh, a half a millimeter uh, of, of spacing, which introduces some interesting complexities from a thermal and mechanical perspective. Uh, but otherwise, the signaling goes uh, through you know, standard um, packaging technologies. It's really in the signaling technology where we have uh, some really cool innovation uh, the, the two chips run on a completely synchronous clock grid, um, and we can essentially go from one latch out of one chip, travel through uh, the packaging, and receive into a latch uh, on the receiving chip with only a two-to-one latency. Uh, and so that signaling technology essentially allows us to build the dual chip module as if it was microarchitecture, only one big chip that we then cut in the middle uh, for manufacturing. Okay, and let me move on to the next, next question. A question from Sri Ganesh Giri at NVIDIA. So what is the bandwidth of the inter socket and the inter draw leaks? Yeah, so but, uh, with, the, um, with the dual chip module, we have uh, 320 gigabytes of bandwidth between the two chips. Uh, again, this is you know, essentially designed as if it was one large chip and, and that dual chip module bus is, you know, microarchitecturally feels a little bit like a staging latch uh, on, on the chip. And then um, across all the chips in the drawer, each link um, uh, in each direction has about 45 gigabytes per second in bandwidth. Okay. And the one question from John and Red Hat. How is memory ordering preserved between cores and accelerators? Uh, well, that's where the magic in, in the cache fabric design is, right? We, we keep track of which data is where. Uh, when, we, when one cache has a cache miss, it broadcasts and, and uh, looks around on the chip, uh, who else has this? And uh, we have certain memory um, state bits that we track in the directories. Uh, that tell us whether we need to broadcast further out uh, across the drawer. And then we have uh, uh, bits that we're tracking on whether we need to, to even go across the whole system scope. Um, and then, uh, of course, when data arrives, uh, we have to make sure that we can't actually use that data on a core uh, before we know uh, that all other copies that need to be invalidated for memory ordering have actually been invalidated. So there's a lot of complexity and tracking all the all the you know information where do you need to go and then there's a lot of complexity in ensuring the handshakes um and of course you need to do those handshakes without introducing too much latencies so, so there's a bit of cycle counting and, and things like that involved to make sure that we uh, maintain the fully coherent um uh, strong ordering that the z architecture has for memory access thank you and then let me move on to the next question. So this one is from Cliff Young at Google. He was asking, silent data corruption has been showing up at 
hyperscale and the cloud scale deployment lately. IBM has a story, the history of doing checking not just the parity and the ECC in memory, but also to protect the logic. Does the power room include that kind of checking and correction for logic? Can you tell us about what's done, please? Yeah, I can, I can say a few things, right? Um, uh, th that, that it's absolutely true that IBM Z has a long history of, of designing the chips uh, for um, you know best possible availability. And of course, that means more than just ECC on the memory. In fact, we are using a technology we call redundant array of independent memory, uh, where we spread cache lines across eight DIMMs. And then when a, um, a DIMM fails, like for example, if a power regulator would fail on a DIMM, uh, we have the error correction code spread across all eight DIMMs, and we can transparently to the software recover the data. The workload just keeps running, even though you've just completely lost the DIMM. So it goes far beyond just the uh, ECC technology. We are applying the same technology on the large level two caches so that even if we have um, catastrophic failures, failures, for example, on an array decoder, we have the ECC code spread out across different array types, uh, array instances, so that we can recover the data. And then as it comes to the logic, we have probably hundreds of thousands of error checkers across the chip um, that check consistency of state machines, uh, that check uh, illegal states, they, they check various handshakes. Uh, and whenever these error checkers uh, trip, we have transparent recovery mechanisms in many cases. For example, the entire core can, uh, we, we have what we call the, the, uh, the checkpoint registers. Uh, whenever we complete an instruction, we update the checkpoint register. And when an error checker pops in the core, be that on a data bus or on one of those control checkers, we can basically flush the core pipeline reset the caches, reset the branch prediction. Basically the core goes through a mini boot sequence, but that it can, then it can reinitialize itself from the checkpoint register. Uh, and it can transparently keep running the software, the operating system doesn't even notice that a core went through such a recovery action. So absolutely, Telem includes a lot of that logic um, across the entire chip uh, and, and a lot of investment uh, in terms of engineering goes into those things to achieve the availability that our clients need. Uh, from these systems. Thank you. And one question from Akash at the Liney Group. How does the Terra maintain its linear scaling across 32 chips? I think it's talking about the performance scaling. Uh, so that's that's it. So we've got to differentiate. There's a lot of uh, scaling work that goes into just generic kind of workload. Um, um, where obviously we invest a lot in the fabric design. I talked a little a bit about this in the presentation about how we optimize the latency uh, between the chips um, and across the drawers to ensure good scalability across the entire um, spectrum um, you know, of the system buildup. Uh, that, that standard workload scaling, obviously, you know, nothing is ever perfectly linear. Uh, but with the investments in latency and bandwidth, et cetera, we get pretty good, uh, pretty good scaling. Uh, the uh, AI uh, chart that I showed, uh, that shows almost perfectly linear scaling because really those are independent tasks. Uh, each chip, when it performs these AI computations, can do so essentially independent of every other chip. The model is contained in the, in the chip local L3 cache or L2 cache. Um, the... Uh, the data is, is local there, the program runs local there. So it doesn't really interact a lot in this benchmark, um, but it still shows how the AI accelerator has the capabilities and the bandwidth to scale up to millions of transactions per second to enable in-transaction inference uh, so that our clients can embed these AI capabilities into each and every one of their transactions. All right. Thank you for answering so many questions in detail, Christian. Then let me move on to the last presentation. The last presentation is from Intel, and the speaker will present the Intel's software rapid next generation Intel Zero scalable processor for data center servers. And let me introduce our speaker, Mr. Arije Biswas. Arije holds a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. 
He joined the Intel in 1997 as a circuit designer and the microarchitect on the first Pentium 4 processor. During his 20 plus year career at Intel, he has done everything from validation and the silicon debugging to reliability modeling and research. He has led the technologies for reliability and usage growth since 2005, developing the foundational science behind the architectural vulnerability factor and the analytical fault modeling also which are uh, published, uh, cited, uh, and taught in many universities. His small team has been responsible for developing and uh, deploying substantial uh, technologies such as uh, Turbo Boost Max 3.0, and I uh, currently serve as the chief architect for Software Rapid. Now, I will we'll start this presentation. Hi. I'm Arija Piswas, Lead Architect for Sapphire Rapids. Thanks for having me here today. I am excited to introduce Sapphire Rapids, our next generation Xeon scalable processor launching in the first half of 2022. We have designed Sapphire Rapids to establish a new standard in data center architecture. It's architected to deliver great out-of-the-box performance with enhanced capabilities for the breadth of workloads and deployment models in the data center. Sapphire Rapids delivers a step function in performance across a broad set of scalar and parallel workloads. Most importantly, it is fundamentally architected for breakthrough performance in elastic computing models. These include containerized microservices and the rapidly expanding use of AI in all forms of data centric compute. Sapphire Rapids also advances the state of the art in memory and IO technologies. Our overall architectural philosophy for Xeon is to deliver the best infrastructure for the data center. As such, Xeon spans a wide range from monolithic server node deployments to data center scale elastic solutions, delivering consistent performance across compute, storage, and network usages. Xeon architecture is optimized to deliver great performance and big improvements at both the node and data center levels. The new performance core in Sapphire Rapids brings significant scalar performance improvements. Additionally, multiple integrated acceleration engines and increased core counts provide for a massive increase in data parallel performance. Furthermore, these performance cores are paired with the right levels of cache and industry-leading system capabilities of DDR5 and PCIe Gen5 to provide optimal balance across compute, memory, and I.O. Finally, all of these are integrated through a modular SOC architecture that provides consistent and efficient performance scaling across the socket, node, and data center. At data center scale, it is critical to deliver great performance and utilization under multi-tenant usages, low jitter performance to meet the tight service level agreements, as well as elasticity across the entire infrastructure. In contrast, industry standard benchmarks tend to focus on node level compute throughput and don't necessarily reflect the reality of data center scale usages. We have drawn on deep insights from multiple generations of Xeon products deployed at cloud scale to inform the Sapphire Rapids architecture. As a result, we deliver big advances in each of these areas. For example, we offer several virtualization and telemetry capabilities to improve multi-tenant usages. We expand quality of service capabilities and architecture enhancements to reduce jitter for performance consistency under high utilization. In addition, we're introducing several microarchitectural and architectural capabilities to improve performance across a broad set of workloads deliver, to deliver better data center elasticity. Data center deployment models exhibit significant overheads. Sapphire Rapids fundamentally changes the paradigm of handling these overheads through acceleration engines. These accelerators not only speed up the overhead processing multifold, but also significantly offloads the cores, enabling them to deliver more application workload performance. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sapphire Rapids. With that, let's dive into the details. At the heart of Sapphire Rapids is a new modular tiled architecture that allows us to scale the Xeon architecture beyond physical reticle limitations. 
Here is that same Sapphire Rapids without the lid, so you can see the silicon underneath and the four tiles. Sapphire Rapids is the first Xeon product built using our latest EMIB silicon bridge technology at a 55 micron bump pitch. This innovative new technology enables independent tiles to be integrated in a single package, realizing a single logical processor. The resulting performance, power, density, and software paradigm is comparable to equivalent monolithic silicon. We are now able to increase core counts, caches, memory, and I.O. free from the physical constraints that would otherwise have been imposed on the architecture, leading to difficult compromises. This base SOC architecture is critical for providing balanced scaling and consistent performance across all workloads. This is key for data center scale elasticity and achieving optimal data center utilization. With this architecture, we are now able to provide software with a single balanced unified memory access with every thread having full access to all resources on all tiles, including caches, memory, and I.O. The result is consistent, low latency, and high cross-sectional bandwidth, achieving over a terabyte per second of aggregate bandwidth across the entire SOC. This is one of the critical ways we achieve low jitter in Sapphire Rapids. While Sapphire Rapids delivers out-of-the-box scalability for existing software and ecosystems, users can also enable clustering at sub-NUMA and sub-UMA levels for additional performance and latency improvements. Sapphire Rapids sets a new standard for data center architecture with the seamless integration of cores and acceleration engines, providing a heterogeneous compute infrastructure. Sapphire's foundation is built on three main pillars. Pillar one is compute. Sapphire Rapids delivers the highest levels of compute performance through a combination of high performance cores, increased core counts, increased AI performance, and the industry's broadest range of data center relevant accelerators. Pillar two is IO. It delivers leadership IO capabilities through CXL 1.1, PCIe Gen 5, and UPI 2.0 technologies. Pillar three is memory. All these are provisioned with Intel's highest bandwidth and low latency memory solutions through industry leading DDR5, Optane, and HBM memory technologies. Now let's look at the details of these three pillars, starting with the data center performance core. As mentioned earlier, optimizing exclusively for standard benchmarks would have been the easy path, but doesn't reflect the full picture of real data center usages. We use the insights from generations of large scale deployments to inform our microarchitecture choices for the performance core. Just to provide a flavor of this, data center workloads exhibit large code footprint and are bottlenecked by front end performance. We fundamentally redesigned the front end to address these bottlenecks in the performance core. Consistent performance under multi-tenant usages is also critical. The core delivers several improvements like VM denial of service protections, enhanced cache, including an increase to two megabytes of private L2 cache per core, and new TLB QoS capabilities for multi-tenant usages. We also introduce autonomous and fine-grained power management to improve core performance without jitter. We also added several new architecture enhancements in the core, including new instructions and capabilities relevant for data center usages. I want to provide a few examples of the new ISA capabilities here. We integrated AMX capabilities to accelerate tensor operations for AI workloads. We're introducing the Accelerator Interfacing Architecture Instruction Set, or AIA, which supports efficient dispatch, synchronization, and signaling to accelerators and devices from user mode, as opposed to high overhead kernel mode. To address the growing demand for signal processing, we've introduced half-precision floating point to AVX. And another example is the CLD mode instruction that helps with optimal movement of data across the cache hierarchy to improve shared data usage models. Another major area of focus for Sapphire Rapids compute capability was to explore breakthrough improvements for the high levels of common mode tasks causing overhead that we see in data center scale deployment models. Instead of traditional approaches, we embarked on a new direction using optimized acceleration engines. We didn't arrive at this decision all at once. Rather, we've been moving in this direction for some time. 
We found these engines to vastly improve processing of these overhead tasks and enable greater utilization of the performance cores for higher user workload performance, all for a significantly reduced power and area cost. But we realized that simply Attaching accelerators was insufficient for truly integrating those functions. The challenge of using dedicated acceleration engines lies in the difficulties around software models, usability, shareability, memory management, and so forth. So we decided the best way to truly address those key challenges was by creating a full set of novel technologies to support seamless integration of dedicated acceleration engines with the general purpose performance cores. Technologies such as AIA and advanced virtualization capabilities enable us to avoid kernel mode overheads and complex memory management typically associated with such schemes. These provide the necessary base functions to simplify enumeration, software development and deployment for acceleration engines. Sapphire Rapid supports critical acceleration engines for processing the most common overheads. I'm excited to introduce a couple of them today. Data center usage models involve significant data movement overhead as part of workload processing. Examples include packet processing, data reductions, and fast checkpointing for virtual machine migration. Sapphire Rapids introduces the data streaming accelerator engine to offload the most common data movement tasks. DSA can move data between CPU caches and DDR memory, as well as IO attached devices. In this graph, we show an open virtual switch use case in which with up to four instances of DSA, we see nearly a 40% reduction in CPU utilization and a 2.5X improvement in data movement performance. This results in nearly doubling the effective core performance for this workload. Intel Quick Assist technology is not new to Intel products. Sapphire Rapids provides seamless integration of the next generation QAT engine, greatly increasing its performance and usability. It is of increasing importance that all data in the data center is secured while processed, transmitted, or stored. Furthermore, the ever-expanding data footprint is progressively maintained in a compressed format for both cost and efficiency. Our next generation QAT acceleration engine supports the most popular ciphers, hash, public key, and compression decompression algorithms, and can chain these together for single pass operations. Performing these functions using QAT is significantly faster than the software implementations on the performance core and greatly reduces the number of cores needed for these widely supported services. Sapphire Rapids QAT can achieve up to 400 gigabits per second of cryptographic ciphers and verified compression and decompression at up to 160 gigabits per second each. In this example with the Zlib L9 compression implementation, we see a 50x drop in CPU utilization while also speeding up the compression by 22 times. Without QAT, this level of performance would require more than 1,000 performance cores to achieve. The Intel Dynamic Load Balancer offloads the task of offload management itself, capable of making up to 400 million load balancing decisions per second. It offloads queue management tasks, provides dynamic load balancing and rebalancing based on awareness of workflows, power, and work priorities. This enables efficient load balancing across CPU cores, which is extremely important for usages such as packet processing and certain types of microservices, and can be used when offloading to either integrated accelerator engines or to discrete devices. With growing compute capabilities, a balanced architecture must deliver commensurate improvement in I.O. Sapphire Rapids delivers breakthrough advancements with its I.O. interfaces, which is our second pillar for Sapphire Rapids. Sapphire Rapids introduces the industry standard Compute Express Link technology, or CXL 1.1, for memory expansion and accelerator usages in the data center. To cater to the growing I.O. speeds and the feeds, we introduce support for PCIe Gen 5, while also enhancing the QoS and DDIO capabilities to go with it. Sapphire Rapids delivers optimal multi-socket performance and scaling 
through advancements to our UltraPath Interconnect or UPI technology that bring more links at wider widths and higher speeds compared to prior generations, including a new eight socket four link GUIS topology that makes use of the new UPI capabilities to deliver higher bandwidths than previous generation eight socket configurations. Improving multi-tenant usages, as well as reducing memory manage overheads, have both been mentioned previously as key capabilities advanced by Sapphire Rapids. Two of the virtualization technologies that enable these are shared virtual memory and scalable I.O. virtualization. SVM is the key technology that enables cores, integrated accelerators, and discrete I.O. devices to significantly reduce memory management overheads by providing a consistent, coherent view of memory on which all computation can occur, regardless of the compute engine actually processing the computations. Scalable ILV greatly improves and simplifies scalability. Sharing and enumeration of device accelerators, integrated or discrete, versus our prior generation single root IOV technology. For a data center processor to deliver across all workloads, the compute and IO capabilities mentioned need to be augmented with the right balance of cache and memory architecture to deliver sustained bandwidth at low latencies, the third pillar of Sapphire Rapids. Sapphire Rapids supports a large shared cache that allows dynamic sharing across the entire socket. We're nearly doubling the shared cache capacity over the prior generation and enhancing the critical QoS capabilities to further improve effectiveness. With industry-leading DDR5 memory technology, we are delivering the next big step function in bandwidth while simultaneously improving power efficiency. In addition, Sapphire Rapids delivers multifold performance improvements and QoS capabilities with our next generation Intel Optane memory. And we're not done with memory just yet. In addition to the support for DDR5 and Optane memory technologies, Sapphire Rapids also offers a product version that integrates high bandwidth memory technology or HBM in package. This delivers higher performance in the dense parallel computing workloads that are prevalent with high performance computing, AI, machine learning, and in-memory data analytics. Typically, CPUs are optimized for capacity, while accelerators and GPUs are optimized for bandwidth. However, with the exponentially growing model sizes, we see constant demand for both capacity and bandwidth without trade-offs. Sapphire Rapids does just that by supporting both natively. We further enhance this with support for memory tiering that includes software visible HBM plus DDR and software transparent caching that uses HBM as a DDR backed cache. AI usage is becoming ubiquitous in the data center due to its success relative to traditional methods. In order to deliver data center scale elasticity, great AI performance is required across all tiers of compute. This is one of the major focus areas for Sapphire Rapids, as I've mentioned previously. We introduced AMX capabilities using a combination of tiled register files and tiled matrix operation units in the new performance core that provide massive speed up to the tensor processing at the heart of deep learning algorithms. We can perform 2K integer eight operations and 1K bfloat 16 operations per cycle. This represents a tremendous increase in computing capabilities that are seamlessly accessible through industry standard frameworks and runtimes. We augment this with strong general purpose capabilities, large caches, high memory bandwidth and capacity to deliver breakthrough performance improvements for CPU-based training and inference. We're also seeing that the vast majority of new scalable services are being built using elastic compute models like containerized microservices. This trajectory was clear when we started architecting Sapphire Rapids. So to address this, we chose capabilities and features to improve the computing model for throughput under SLA with low infrastructure overheads. We made architecture enhancements across the product, spanning the core accelerators and SOC capabilities to inform these improvements. For example, the AIA capabilities that reduce microservice startup time, advanced telemetry improvements for optimal microservice load balancing and orchestration, and a number of capabilities in QAT, DSA, DLB, and beyond 
to reduce the networking stack overhead with a microservices service mesh. We've been using multiple proxy workloads to develop these capabilities and optimize the open source software stack to benefit from them. This chart shows the speed ups we are seeing in our architectural models and from some early measurements on Death Star Bench and other example proxies, normalized at the per core level. In summary, Sapphire Rapids delivers a massive leap in performance and capabilities to establish a new standard in data center architecture. At the root of Sapphire Rapids is a modular, tiled SOC architecture, thanks to EMIM technology, that enables significant scalability yet maintains a monolithic view. It delivers substantial performance across scalar usages and massive improvements in emerging parallel workloads like AI. It delivers great improvements for monolithic workload deployment models, while exclusively optimizing for elastic compute models like microservices. It brings industry standard leading memory and IO technologies to feed the massive compute capabilities in a balanced manner. As one would expect with all of this, Sapphire Rapids is a complex undertaking, and I would like to thank the many teams across all of Intel that are bringing Sapphire Rapids to market. We can't wait to get Sapphire Rapids into your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arite. It was a very great talk. And again, we have a lot of questions. <clears throat> and among them, many of them are related to HBM. So, a question from Hiroyuki. Does HBM cache mode consist of the direct map? And another question was, where do you keep the tab if the HBM is configured as a cache? about uh, the HBM memory, exactly how it's configured, what it's associated to be used, and we tell the later dates. We're not talking about styling bandwidth, you know, organizations or anything just yet. Sorry about that. Okay. And uh, moving on to other questions. Arnie, with no affiliation, he was asking, how is the AI performance of AMX compared to NVIDIA A100? A so I don't have that comparison uh, right now, but uh, you know, as we mentioned, basically we're seeing a, an AMX improvement over uh, AMX 512 when using the AMX on Imager 810. Um, so we showed a demo uh, of an AI workload in, um, uh, in, in an architecture day, and I think that presentation is up on YouTube now. You can go look at it. Where we show the workload, see uh, roughly a 7.8 um, speed up using AMX. And that doesn't answer your question versus the uh, NVIDIA. Um, there are those kinds of details we're going to uh, reveal in the later days as well. Okay, and you have already answered many of the questions, and I do have uh, two questions. So usually Intel CPU support the DDIO, and when HPM is used as a cache, I wonder where the data goes first when the DDIO is enabled. Is it going to be L3 cache or is it going to be HPM? Okay, so it's not going to go to HPM, right? Okay, and my second question is about CXL. So CXL is a very interesting interconnect providing the cache coherency and also memory expansion interface. And that kind of interface is not the first time. IBM did the CAPI in the past. Can you compare CXL against the CAPI and uh, what has been improved over CAPI in the past? So the uh, intent is uh, pretty similar, right? A low latency coherent interface for um, accelerator devices, whether integrated or discrete. Um, the what I can tell you is on CXL for you know our version CXL 1.1, we have support for what we call type one devices, which is effectively IO devices. So that's an IO protocol that looks very similar to PCIe. 
stand there to pass through devices, which are essentially accelerators with its own uh, past and memory, and basically maintaining coherency between uh, passes and, and, um, and memory, so basically being able to have a protocol that allows those devices to act as a cache agent and the memory controller. Um, so three devices is something where I'm uh, not supporting the central access time frame. It's related to um, just for two later generations. Two years, and that one is where we basically have memory devices where you can essentially do memory expansion through CXL. Um, there are these two test sets are open. They're available online. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of similarities, and then there's uh, a lot of differences. I would. Uh, all right, thank you for the answer. And uh, Raj with the unknown affiliation is asking whether you can comment on the interdict crossing latency. Yeah, so I think I've, I've answered this a couple of places. Basically, think of it as low single digit latency, not narrow spectrum latency. Um, it's a, a little bit different between the vertical and the horizontal crossing. Uh, but they're all going to be in that, that low single digit latency, uh, nanosecond latency type of event. All right. So I don't see any new questions that have not been answered. So thank you again, and it was a, such a great talk. Thank you. So we we'll actually talk about it as we have time. There were a couple of questions on okay. the accelerator engine. I was going to take those into the Q&A and I'll save them for this. Okay. Because it's kind of the same answer. So there was a question about QAT and DSA and how it works. So all of these accelerator engines do look like PCI devices to the system. They will require um, you know, PCI drivers and, uh, and software to run, so they are not demo devices. They will require software drivers. Uh, but they are uh, they are part of the AIA framework. So they do work with the AIA instruction sets. They work with all the advanced virtual racing capabilities I talked about. Um, they effectively, but they do effectively look like um, like all the devices to the system. So hopefully that answers that question. That applies to all of them here at the QAT and the other sets. All right, so since we have a little bit more time, let me ask you another question from Light from Alibaba. Can you comment uh, more on uh, Sapphire Rapid's the QoS capabilities? Does the SPR support last level cache partitioning, memory bandwidth partitioning, and uh, what else compared to the, the previous generation? Yeah, so for the previous generation, then they did kind of introducing uh, some L2 um, cache partitioning technologies, there's L2 um, cache allocation technology, and then there's the L2 um, code data parameterization. So those are all supported in the cycle models. All right. Thank you so much for the detailed uh, answers. And let me conclude this session. Thank you, everyone.